Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here in person. Uh, this is the uh, Oregon Lickett and Cannabis Commission uh, meeting of September 23rd, 2021. And please take the roll. Commissioner Curran? Here. Commissioner Floyd? Here. Commissioner Harper? Okay, so Commissioner Harper is supposed to be virtual, but don't hear him. Um, Commissioner Melitas? Here. Commissioner Raval? Here. Chair Rosenbaum? Here. Okay, I, uh, let me leave the roll open for Commissioner Harper. Is he on? I can't tell. I can't tell if he is. If he is, it's not virtual. Okay. Um, First thing is the administration, Commission of Education, Staff Administrative Reports, and uh, Rich Evans first uh, on marijuana testing in Southern Oregon. Before Rich gets started, let me just uh, take a few moments to talk about the operation. Rich is going to report on Table Rock, our direct work there, but as you know, that came out of House Bill 3000 during the last session. Um, that bill is really a combination of three big things. All the Delta 8 THC stuff that was going to miners and stores that you took quick action on to get the concentration standards for THC. So we keep it out of the hands of miners. It uh, provided for creating a class A misdemeanor for growing cannabis outside a state program, with which law enforcement used to good effect uh, this summer. And then uh, also uh, created the task force to, to look to the future. In that, uh, we got to set a testing regime uh, up and you provided the rules to, for which to use under ODA's program to determine what marijuana is, not to determine what hemp was, um, but to look and sort of see how much uh, illegal growing we had under the I'm very proud of the SWIFT work what the legislature did, your commission, this commission did, and our partners at ODA, at state police. Uh, you know, how many times do you pass a piece of legislation and have immediately actionable results within three months? I mean, and you passed the first rule on the day the governor signed the bill. Uh, so uh, we got a lot to work on. I think the task force offers a path to the future, and Rich is going to report on her direct results we got out of our work. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Uh, my name is Richard Evans, and I am the Senior Director of Licensing and Compliance for OLCC. What I wanted to do today is kind of give you a brief overview of what I think is going on in Southern Oregon as it, in terms of marijuana. All of, all of this uh, marijuana or hemp and marijuana, illegal marijuana, affects our recreational market, as, as you well know. We started um, once Senate Bill or House Bill 3000 passed, we started within uh, 10 days uh, operating in Southern Oregon. We had to set up interagency agreements with the Jackson, Josephine uh, County Sheriff's Office, the Oregon State Police, the Medford Police Department, and the Oregon Department of Agriculture to even start. We passed rules. Um, this commission passed temporary testing rules, and we also um, purchased equipment so that we would be able to test uh, and make sure that we knew the difference between hemp and cannabis and marijuana in Southern Oregon. We actually um, started out with uh, approximately 20 employees per week. We worked for eight straight weeks before COVID shut us down. We had some employees that got COVID um, and then unfortunately transferred that to their families. We are still in the process of working down in Southern Oregon with our Medford staff. I'm going to give you some basic stats and some of the information that we obtained from, from being down there. Um, the first thing I want to tell you is that there's a lot of confusion, I think, in public and uh, in law enforcement and the, basically the state of Oregon on, on who is responsible for what grows and how that goes. And what it's, you know, I break it down into five different grow, grow types of growth. The first one is the home grow. We really don't have any problems with the home grow. The second is our recreational marijuana grows under OLCC. We all are aware of those. 
We have the medical marijuana grows under OHA, and what we found in this operation is that a lot of the locations that hemp had hemp uh, registered through ODA also had medical marijuana on the premises, and some of those locations actually had recreational marijuana on the same locations and tap lots. So there's a lot of confusion about who is actually responsible for some of those. Um, then uh, under the authority given to ODA, we were able to uh, test the hemp under the ODA program, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. But the elephant in the room is the just the illegal growths that are out there that nobody in the state has responsibility for. I believe from my experience down there, there are more illegal growths than there are registered growths um, under our program or under the hemp program. There, I get calls from legislators almost on a daily basis um, asking about locations, and um, a lot of those are not registered under any state program. They're just, frankly, growing uh, marijuana in out in front of everybody and their brother, hoping that uh, law enforcement doesn't have enough criteria or experience or um, resources to get to them. Can I ask a, uh, there was a statement you just made that confused me. You said that as far as the illegal um, growth are concerned, your words with nobody has responsibility for. Um, what I'm saying is nobody has responsibility in, under a state program. They're just flat out illegal black market operations. And the only one that has authority over those, Commissioner, is law enforcement. Right. So when you say nobody has responsibility for it, it means that nobody in the agencies are looking spe specifically at this. It's just they left it up to law enforcement. Correct. No, no state agency has authority to do anything. We have no authority to do anything. Uh, with those growth. So it is, it falls back on local law enforcement. And they're overwhelmed to a certain extent. Yes, sir. Okay, that's the point I've jumped back. Thank you. Yes. And so on, for House Bill 3000, we began uh, looking at all the hemp growths. And before registered hemp growths, there were a large number of hemp growths uh, that were still in application process with ODA. I believe there were over 200 of those. We drove by most of those locations or all of those locations to see if they had plants in the ground because under HB 3000, if they had plants in the ground, they were not able to come into the program. ODA was working and processing those applications as we moved through the summer. So there are some, the numbers continue to grow, but frankly, they weren't letting a lot of folks into the program as they were just continuing to process those. So we started out with um, a total of 316 locations that we went to. Some of our locations, um, we, we treated this just like a normal um, law enforcement operation and that we did threat assessments for every location that we went to. A threat assessment's basically a risk factor on whether or not um, our employees would be safe at this location. Um, if they, if the locations met a certain criteria, we required that we had law enforcement with us under HB 3000. Um, it allowed law enforcement to stand by with us. A large number of these locations met that criteria, and so we had to do interagency agreements with law enforcement. So out of the 316 locations um, that we uh, were able to go to, we tested or have results for 212 of those locations. 58% of those uh, resulted in positive tests. 114 of them were positive for the presence of marijuana in a quantitative or a presumptive test. A quantitative test will actually give you on a mature plant a THC count. The highest THC that we tested was 32.9% THC. The, um, and then on the immature plants, we test for a ratio of CBD to THC and all the positives tested a ratio of THC1 to no CBDs in the immature plants. Um, 16, at, well, these stats are effective on 916 because we continue to work. We actually have people going out today and following up on some of these issues. There's 104 um, other locations, 20 of them are in the process of being tested. 59 of the locations were not growing anything. It was just bare, bare, Fields. There were some evidence uh, once we started the operation. We got numerous phone calls from licensees and neighbors saying that in the middle of the night, trucks were showing up and marijuana was disappearing or hemp were, were being harvested in the middle of the night and things were disappearing. Uh, nine uh, locations, we know that there is 
cannabis growing, but we cannot contact the owners. And at 16 locations, we've been flat out denied entry. Um, under ODA rules, um, we uh, have to apply for a administrative search warrant to get to a location um, if they deny us entry. And as of uh, the 16th of September, we had served 10 administrative warrants where we were, we would apply for a warrant through ODA and then we'd actually go on the location and sample uh, the cannabis to see if it was marijuana or, um, or hemp. And all of those have turned out, the refusals have turned out to be marijuana. In, in retrospect, if you look at the totality of the program, OLCC, the Jackson and Josephine counties have. How long does it take between the time you're denied and the time you can get an administrative warrant? You can get it right away, but what we need to prove is that the person denied access. So oftentimes we will attempt two or three times, but uh, Commissioner, one of the tactics that was um, used or that we heard is we had some growers that said, I'm out of town for three or four weeks in Disneyland. I can't be back till September 20th. And so it's more of a soft refusal instead of a, a, a no, you can't. We did have those, but there are a lot of folks that said, oh, I'm in California or I'm in some other location. I'll be back in two weeks. Can you wait till then? Um, obviously, <clears throat> under the growing conditions, some of that stuff ended up being harvested before we could do it. But if you had uh, a warrant, it takes about a day to write. And then it also, um, you have to have it signed. And then we always use law enforcement on the administrative warrant, so it takes time for us to set them up. Usually a week to 10 days is by the time we get everything set up to go, execute that warrant from the top of that. But we do our due diligence to make sure the refusal is a refusal. We just don't call them once and say, hey, I can't be there today. I can be there in three or four days, and then we set up another appointment. It's the ones where we get we're totally unresponsive are the ones that we ended up applying for administration. Who signs the, the executive warrant? Circuit court judges. Circuit court judges in circuit Jackson court. County, in Josephine okay. County, yes, you apply to the circuit court. In totality, I wanted to let you know that Jackson and Josephine counties are number one grow, grow locations in the rec market and in the hemp market. In contrast, we have 500 <laughs> OLCC registered grows in those two counties. And what you guys know already is that um, our licensees are um, contained with grow sizes. They can't go outside the grow sizes. There are 335, as of today, registered grow sites in Jackson and Josephine County that are hemp. Some of these hemp grows are 10 times the size of our locate of our grow sites um, in in sheer size. They may have 30, 40, 50 large hoop houses, greenhouses, other locations. So frankly, what I see is they're even at 50%, they have the capability of growing more marijuana. If it's if you take 50% of that and you look at it and you look at the sheer size and volume of what they're growing, they're able to probably outproduce our recreational producers um, only when 50% or more are illegal. Um, some of these locations are just absolute giants. I, I don't know if you've watched the videos of the flyovers from Jackson and Josephine County, but these are very large, uh, complex operations that have been set up for the purpose of growing hemp or marijuana. Most of the large scale ones that you see have tested positive um, for uh, marijuana. There are a lot of other smaller operations where farmers are actually growing hemp. And we ran into those obviously, um, and you know, about a little less than 50%, but those tend to be a little smaller in size and more of a, uh, more of a typical farming operation, not a commercial, commercial operation. One of the things that our authority limited limited us to is that we were only able to um, look at other violations of criminal law that were in plain sight. We had a lawful authority to be on the premises, frankly, to test marijuana, and that is it. We could go into the into the premises, test the marijuana, and leave. Um, under some DOJ advice. If there's other criminal activity, we couldn't actually uh, investigate it. We don't have the authority. We would refer, refer things we saw to law enforcement. We couldn't actually go around looking for other violations. 
but we could document what we saw. We saw, um, we referred 17 different water issues when we were out there where people were diverting water out of uh, surface water, um, pumping straight out of the rivers, creeks, and, and dams, which is a water issue is a big issue in Southern Oregon right now. We referred uh, 10 cases to the Department of uh, Human Services on living conditions for the employees. Frankly, we saw folks that were living in tents in the greenhouses, um, laying, sleeping on the ground with a pad, uh, sleeping in tractor sheds, cooking off of, um, you know, primitive camping and not enough food and water for the employees to sustain, no bathrooms. Um, it was pretty, uh, some of the pictures are very disheartening of, of what we saw. So the living conditions for the employees are frankly uh, very disturbing. Um, we also had um, four OSHA labor complaints and then two animal abuse complaints that we referred to law enforcement in totality of it. So if you look at the totality of what we were doing and, and what we were seeing down there, you will, I will tell you that the, the problem, we only had authority to focus in two counties, but I'm getting calls from all over the state. Um, even Tillamook County has a very large um, outdoor grow right now that they believe might be marijuana. Uh, they're popping up all over the state and frankly, they're uncontrolled law enforcement will tell you like in Josephine and Jackson County with their full teams, they can go to one, maybe two of these search warrants a week because of the return of the search warrant to evidence, criminal interviews, you know, we go and test. They actually interview everybody there trying to figure out who is responsible. They do a more complete investigation. And frankly, the referrals that we gave them, um, they were not able to keep up with where we'd say, hey, this is marijuana, this field tested. You know, there's 20 greenhouses and the THC level was 20% uh, in these greenhouses. Some of those ended up being harvested because of a lack of resources. So the threat to the recreational market, in my opinion, is real. Um, there is a, a big uh, or a large amount of illegal grows. There's obviously some marijuana being grown under the ODA program uh, for hemp and uh, resources and the ability to control this has been a big issue. If you look at in the totality, our recreational growers are competing with, uh, you know, leasing property. They're competing with uh, labor. They're competing with raw skills, water rights, all these things, and these illegal um, drug trafficking organizations that come in have cash, and they pay cash and exorbitant rates for that. It's frankly um, causing a very, uh, you know, if you're playing by the rules under our recreational market, you're, you're playing behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. And then obviously there's a lot of marijuana that is that is hitting the streets, whether that stays in Oregon or or move to other locations around the country. Obviously that would take time and investigations, but the first administrative warrant that we served, we found uh, a numerous uh, Costco black and yellow totes full of marijuana and then marijuana uh, packaged in one pound bags labeled ready for sale to go out the door. And so in totality, you know, all of our employees worked their tails off. We had 20 to 25 people for um, 10 to 12 weeks straight. Um, I was down in Medford personally for six weeks straight. Um, this was a big endeavor and we actually are very proud of the employees at OLCC and the work that they did with ODA. ODA has six people statewide for their hemp staff. And so half of their hemp staff were people in Medford every week, and then we had all of our recreational and our uh, medical folks working. But like I said, there were locations that we went to that had hemp grows, medical grows, and then uh, recreational marijuana grows on all the same tax lot. And depends on who shows up, they say who is what. You know, all mapped out. But we also found additional grow locations. Water rights are different under medical marijuana as they are direct marijuana. It's not against the rules to have medical marijuana sprinkled into your hemp fields. There's no rules against that. So some of the defense has been, hey, you tested my medical marijuana plants that were in my hemp field, um, and that's why they came back positive. So you have lots of different agencies working hard, um, different rules. Um, for cannabis under three different state agencies and then the flat out illegal location. Um, I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. Um, I will tell you that 
you know, I won't say it again, but our employees did a great job. Some of them sacrificed their time and effort. We had folks in procurement here get IIAs, which interagency state agreements usually take a month or two. We had them done in two or three days. They were working especially hard to try to get this about. And uh, I just can't say enough for the employees at OLCC and ODA to collaborate to get this on the ground less than 10 days from when the governor signed the bill to actually being operational and in the field and working with our local partners. The sheriffs in both Jackson and Josephine County and the state police and the city of Medford were uh, great partners for us. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, they were sacrificing um, resources for us to, to help us because I did not want to send any of our employees into a location that was unsafe. As you know, we're unarmed and some of these locations, frankly, are drug trafficking organizations and they have, they have arms and they have their, you know, their pretty dangerous locations. So um, I'm very proud of the operation and support that we, we had from our exec team and uh, I'll answer any questions you may have. Commissioners? A couple. Um, so you mentioned uh, like Tillamook County's reached out, and has there been interest from some of the other counties uh, to to do something like this? Up, I mean, like Black Miss Washington County, anything like that. So um, basically, what you have, Commissioner, is that law enforcement is strapped, and they don't have enough resources to do these. They have the drug teams, but what you're finding is. Under CJC, the Criminal Justice Council, there are grants for Josephine and Jackson County, and they've received $3 million each to set up teams in those counties to do the work. But a lot of other counties like Tillamook, there's no drug team in Tillamook County. And so there's nobody to really do that work. But we get calls almost on a daily basis. The third county that has a lot of hemp grows is Deschutes County, and they're having their own water issues. So what I would tell you is that we've pushed on the grows in Josephine and Jackson County. I wouldn't be surprised if they move to other locations where law enforcement around the state isn't so robust and where there's no drug teams and where they can make a profit. They're going to, you know, cartels and drug trafficking organizations expect to lose 10 to 20 percent of their their overall uh, crop every year. And they will continue to take risk until the entire state is protected. And frankly, there's not enough resources. There are locations where they're being they're not being checked. So it's a resources issue. Like, yes, sir. At, and out of curiosity, the, the product that's seized, what's what's done with the pro that product? So there's two ways that it's seized. If we refer to law enforcement and they go out and seize it, they will destroy it through a court order and do a criminal case. If it goes through the ODA process, they have administrative hearing rights just like we do here at OLCC. They will issue a property order. Um, or an embargo on the crop and then go through a legal process that takes sometimes six, eight to 10 to 12 weeks. One of the issues with that is the crop has been, some of the crops have disappeared while the embargo is on and that's a violation in the ODA process. But if you can make, you know, several million dollars on your crop, you'll take your ODA fund. And typically if, if the people are kicked out of the system for ODA and they work through it, um, what'll happen is they'll just replace the grower with a new person next year on the same location. And so a lot of that marijuana is hitting the streets unless law enforcement actually comes out and does a warrant and seizes it. And that's what really slows them down. If there's, you know, some of these locations have over a hundred thousand plants and to, you know, 30 or 40 greenhouses for them to take care of all of that, it's a two or three day process. And so that's, that's where resources again become the main issue on stopping uh, these illegal uh, drug trafficking organizations. Yeah, it's uh, well, great work. I mean, it's really impressive. I think uh, it's gets my wheel turning on how to get more resources to work on it. But good stuff. Anybody else? I, I, just, I have one question. I, this is eventually a question for the executive director Marx, but. From your perspective, you've been out there. Where are we going with this? You know what? What I think needs to happen, and obviously this is from Rich Evans' opinion from 34 years in law enforcement in the state of Oregon. But what I have found is if you push on a certain area, they will move. What we need is a statewide program and resources statewide to battle the illegal marijuana growers, whether they come in. 
um, that they're flat out in the legal grow or if somebody's diverting from the recreational medical, you need a statewide program. What has happened, in my opinion, is that we made um, marijuana legal in Oregon and we had a bunch of our licensees jump into the legal program, but that also invited a bunch of other folks into the state to take advantage of, hey, everybody's growing marijuana and look at the avenues. And until there's enough resources to control the entire state, the recreational market is always going to be in danger because you are at a disadvantage by playing by the rules, an extreme disadvantage on prices, supplies, and if somebody is playing outside of the market, they can they have a huge financial advantage against you. So and until I think that you know Director Marks and others are working on this, but until we control the illegal market in the state of Oregon, our recreational market will always be at risk. And I yeah, think it's I, about resources. It's pretty obvious. Uh, what you've done is just identified a huge problem, and now you need the resources to go after it. Correct. I mean, it's just it's pretty obvious. Uh, it, it, you hear about the fact we have legal legalization of marijuana, and it's dried up the, uh, you know, the legal drug trade, which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, the sheriff of Jackson County will give you stats that since the legalization of marijuana um, is criminal uh, uh, conduct or crimes occurring in the county has gone up exponentially. Um, and that has to do with criminal enterprises coming in to use the opportunity. Most citizens don't know when they see a, a crop, whether it's hemp, marijuana, recreational, illegal, you know, basically it, just, they're so used to or accustomed to seeing it, they don't know who is what. And frankly, there's so much that they're taking the chance of, of, of not getting caught by running these operations. So strictly from a strict business point of view, this is what I'm trying to get at. Um, if we, whatever resources we need, and they're going to be significant, the only way we're going to get those resources is for this agency, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, this agency to show that the loss of revenue that we have by not going further on this is extremely detrimental to the state and that the state will benefit from a financial point of view if we put these minuscule resources in compared to what we're losing in revenue. Am I right? No, Mr. Chairman, for the record, Steve Marks, Executive Director, you're, you're absolutely right. And really, what we were going to be following up on this week, today, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow with the legislature was exactly these next step issues, right? About talking about how we get the funding for enforcement and how we show the need. But if we're in Oregon and we want to build this sector as a major part of our economy, which we and our licensees have put, you know, enormous effort and capital into in Oregon. And if we want to participate in interstate commerce, uh, we've got to have a system that is legal, that is controlled. And right now, we've done a good job. And through no fault of our own or our licensees, uh, the impacts are pretty dire. You know, the folks I work with on Canada, the National Administrators Association, they know this summer, this fall, they're going to get a bunch of illegal more marijuana in their states. And uh, that hurts our national efforts of getting our licensed growers that are doing it right uh, to, you know, nationalize markets. So in the long-term picture over time, the next, as you say, Mr. Chairman, looking out 10 years, uh, this is a tremendous harm to the economic vision, I think, we have with cannabis in the state of Oregon. We've got to get control of this. Beyond this, in Southern Oregon, I mean, Rich was uh, really pointing and talking about how the sheriff's view, the people down there, this is, goes well beyond marijuana. This goes to hazardous materials, it goes to the environment, the water, the way they're treating people, and quite frankly, the culture and way of life in Southern Oregon. Uh, it is the greatest, uh, right now, I believe, in my estimation, and, happy to tell you and legislators and the governor, right? It is a huge existential threat to Oregon's well-being, future economy, way of life in Southern Oregon, and it is inciting corruption. You know, we had officers that were uh, directly bribed uh, when they came out, <laughs> tried to be bribed when they came out. 
uh, we have seen the farmers, good farmers, take the cash and let the illegal operators do what they want on their property. Uh, this is very insidious, wow. and and we got to get control control over it. The next steps then are really working with the framework. I think of Senate Bill the three thousand the House Bill three thousand. Um, We've got to follow up on all the testing that you need to put products into the market that are legal. There's a lot of testing. We have used a lot of testing and to go out of our own capabilities just to do this. Law enforcement needs multi-year funding, not a two-year horizon, and not just, and there was actually two other counties funded out of the CJIS grant. The has got flat level continuation of funding, and they have it in Polk County for a little bit. Uh, but we need statewide funding and we need multi-year funding to clean up uh, these operations. The great thing that we did this grow cycle is we developed the technologies that we just need to enhance to employ greater to get after illegal growers, but they need more people power and it needs a multi-year effort. ODAs, uh, have, uh, you know, when you are 58% of that grow under hemp is marijuana. They've lost, you know, we've lost control. Uh, we also lost it in our name, but we weren't in control of that. So we lost control of it. And we've got to um, gain it. ODAs, uh, the important part of 3000 gave them new authority under the farm bill to be able to do background checks, but I'm not sure that goes enough. Law enforcement needs common systems to look at this. So. I'm looking forward to the discussions we're going to have and looking for the resources. And I know the legislative committees are very interested in doing that. The House has made its legislative appointments to the task force. Uh, the Senate has not yet, and then the governor has appointments to make besides the uh, right positions. But I think that'll be, you know, that was divine, although the scope is broad enough to look at the issues of how you track hemp grows and how you test for items of human consumption, but they have on ramps to talk about future of interstate commerce, to talk about enforcement. The turn is clearly on enforcement. Um, to have a strong conversation about that first step and uh, looking forward to it. Everything you said is correct, it's right. I don't believe it will move the needle half as much as you want it to do, unless you do this. Only my opinion. Bill has to, let me go step one better. We got what we needed for the new warehouse because we showed that we were going to lose a billion dollars in revenue over a period of time if we didn't get it. And that was a clear cut indication that we had to do it or we're going to leave, lose, leave revenue on the table for this state, for the people in this state. Bill needs to put, in only my opinion, Bill needs to put together the loss of revenue as a result. And I, look, it, it's it's not accurate 100%, but but it's part of the, the opportunity for the legislation, particularly, to understand the loss that we're having on this thing. And we move the needle by showing the loss. We have the, the second or third largest revenue source in this state. It's important. This is a very important agency in terms of revenue. And you have to show everything is true, but you have to show the loss of potential revenue in order to get to where you want to go. Because if you show that loss and then you ask for X amount of money, which is minuscule compared to what that loss is, it'll move the needle and everything else you're saying is going to come into play because then you're going to get the revenue to do what you want to do or, or the, the funding to do what you want. I like teasing Rich because our backgrounds are similar. I think one of the things you're, that we're, we're missing is we would have to be very naive to believe that the legislature is going to simply look at this as a revenue situation. When you're looking at the counties in which Rich was just talking about, those law enforcement organizations get their money from local residents, tax revenue. And unless the legislature is prepared to increase the amount of money they're going to put to every locale in the state of Oregon and the law enforcement side. This is not a revenue situation. 
this is a law enforcement situation. When you have men and women who are just work to the bone every day and they're understaffed because the community can't afford to have that organization fully staffed, then you're going to have men and women who are going to make mistakes. They're going to be harmed because they're tired. There's going to be issues around that. This is not simply a revenue situation that we're going to lose money. My takeaway from what Rich is saying is, is that we have an entire state where we don't have enough law enforcement in order to control the illegal activities of individuals with a lot of money and weapons. It's a big difference. It changes lifestyle, the ability to live well in your own community because of what's going on every day. Lifestyle issues become the issue in that community because you don't have the ability to deal with those individuals who don't care how you live. They're not there to make a good decision. Yes. So we can talk to the legislator about um, I'd like to follow up with Melissa Thompson. As an organization, as a state, and we're about to get national. As soon as the Senate changes the rule, as soon as banking yeah. becomes available, you got to decide, the legislature's got to decide and how we get them to move that needle forward. Who do you want in control of that banking operation? Who do you want in, in, in control of that interstate commerce? Yeah. People I who mean, are I've, I talked to her less wet tears inside the legal situation or someone from another state or another country who is sophisticated um, enough it, to control the mar market. Telehealth, right? So it's not it's not what we're talking yeah, about. Winter, we winter, can talk to the winter, state winter. from winter. our perspective, but if we don't talk to the state about how to increase the revenue stream mm -hmm. for those communities who don't have the money mm -hmm. to have a full staff sheriff department, police agency, or state police is down to fund it again. I used to worry that when competition came, it would come from another state who was more sophisticated than we were. And Matt, you remember me having that conversation. I no longer have that worry. My worry is, I'm looking at this, that operation with that many greenhouses, what time? that's not Constellation buying these greenhouses. That's not Morrison Coors buying these greenhouses. This is not RJ Reynolds buying these greenhouses. These are individuals who work with weapons. So it's a bigger issue than us. If the state is going to look at low, losing revenue, it needs to stop that loss by somehow developing a situation that they're going to fund or help fund the law enforcement communities who have this issue. And it's the state of Oregon. And I'm not just talking about this because I used to be a cop. I'm talking about this because I'm a business person. And this is how we're going to look at this, not simply by yourself. But the state has to come up with a way that they're going to fund law enforcement at the levels needed in order to make this a good business decision. Just my idea. Last comment. I'll ask you again. Tell me your opinion. Where are we going with this? I believe that, you know, long term, Oregon has to control the illicit market. And how they do that will, will to Marvin Commissioner Revolt's point, is will control how influential Oregon is in the national market when it opens up. Because Commissioner Revolt is absolutely right. The money is tremendous. It is it's so inconsistently. Legitimate companies. and. Frankly, you know, what we're hearing from our folks is that why am I playing all these games and rules and abiding by these rules when I can make more money or there's no risk for me to go the other way. And so for me, it's the if Oregon does not control the illicit marijuana market, we're going to miss out on the national market. And the one thing that I want to hit on is the quality of life in Southern Oregon is the number one complaint from the citizens down there, whether they have armed guards out in front of the marijuana grow in front of their house, water rights, um, the smell, um, the human trafficking issues, 
these in, the, these folks working in the field. This is a human atrocity in, in my mind. Um, it's a quality of life. It isn't just the criminal activity. It's the way of life of Southern Oregon. If we don't get a grasp on it, it's going to expand all the way through Oregon, which it already has, and make certain areas of Oregon unlivable. And so where we're going, Commissioner, I hope that the, the task force starts to address these issues and coordinates a response. I do know that the governor uh, was briefed every week on this issue. Um, we speak with them weekly. I know that they're involved in this, and I know that the legislators in Southern Oregon are all bonded together, Democrats, Republicans, independents on this issue, because it's such an issue with their constituents. I have faith that I'm hoping that we can get to a point where we can start to control this. And instead of looking at it as a, as a, you know, how I described it in a five tier program, we move to one tier, one plant, one world, and we move forward with regulation. And if you're not in the legal market, then the resources would be there to uh, exterminate your business or eradicate the marijuana and hold the folks accountable. I, I, we're spending all this time because this issue is not going away. It's going to be here for a long time. And, and I think it's important for all of us to understand what's going on, obviously. You said that Oregon has to control the market, okay? The question I want just to zero in on is the legislature is going to be responsible for funding this program so Oregon can control this situation, correct? Yes, sir. The legislature is going to have to give money to local agencies to increase, including local police, to increase their, their capabilities, correct? Or are you saying that we should do it on a state level? I think you need both, to be honest with you. Um, I do think that we have counties that are impacted that need the resources on the ground. What I will tell you from the sheriffs and the local drug teams, they actually know the folks, but as you, if you push on one county, they're gonna to move to another county and you have to have both the state and the local um, resources to do this. There was one search warrant that was served when I was down in, in um, Southern Oregon that there were over a hundred state troopers at where a, a, a homicide occurred or a dead body showed up on one of these roads. And they had law enforcement from the entire state there. And everybody in the Josephine County, Jackson County, and the Bedford drug teams were on that location. So it took all the resources of the locals and all the resources of the state. And you can't just build it up one area. You have to have every county sustainable and then the state to take care of the bigger problems and supplement um, supplement the enforcement. You have to do it both ways, in my opinion, sir. And, and the only one who's going to do that is the legislature has to appropriate the money, right? So right. I agree completely with Commissioner Revelle. I understand what he's saying. I, I agree completely. We have to find a method to convince the legislature that they have to fund the whole thing. Correct. All right. And my point is, the best way to do that is to compare, and Bill understands this better than anybody, compare the cost of doing that compared to what we're gonna lose if we don't do it. That's all I'm saying. Yes, sir. But that has to be crystal clear to get to the point where you need to be. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I think the prize in that dollar net value equation is interstate commerce. And I don't think an Oregon program that the federal government is going to certify a program for Oregon if you have massive, uncontrolled, illegal diversion right. affecting every other state's market in the country. Yeah, we're, we're in agreement. That's, that's the big loss, right? We are roughly, we'll put $300 million from Canada's tax into the next budget. You know, you can say about 50 million we might lose because there's lower prices out there. People aren't buying at our retail stores. There's a proliferation of illegal marijuana that people have access to, and they don't have to go to our retail. So we'll lose money in the state, but that is not nearly the value. It's having the risk of a good, controlled system that can engage in fair and, uh, and secure interstate commerce. That is entirely the future of Oregon. It goes hand in glove. Yeah. I mean, well, you can't separate those two. They, they all go together. I don't want to miss something in this discussion we had because I think, for, just for the record, it's the uh, you know the Farm Bill of 2018 did no one any good. Uh, 
uh, it created an interstate system around hemp, and it showed us exactly what happens if you have a porous, uncontrolled cannabis growth. People will take advantage of it. Congress has got to change that. I hope the legislature puts as the next step additional controls on top of the federal controls in the hemp program to be able to assure that we're not getting these cross-border issues and we're not having to run out and redactively protect our legal system, which we've done a good job with. Certainly it has its problems, but not on this order. And, uh, and we've got to look at that issue as well for sure. So look forward to that. I'll just add that California's cannabis uh, folks gave us a call recently and they said, gee, we're getting a lot of trucks heading south from Oregon. We're concerned about all that. Um, and I told them that we'd seen a lot of California license plates at the uh, hemp grows that we were at. Uh, there is a big interest in the cross-border issues right now. And I think that just bodes for the cannabis system, not hemp, not marijuana, cannabis, to be able to know what's being transported between states. You know, we don't even know what, we didn't even know what was in our own grocery stores in Oregon until we figured out that Delta 8 issue and the testing. We need uh, cannabis to be, we need to get it into a box that we can then uh, put it out for the public safety. And right now, we let certain aspects of it out of the box of the big, responsibility for that was the Farm Bill 2018. Okay. Thank you. 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 Uh, we have a couple other things. Rich, uh, the recall, I like bet you said Jason's on. And I can just do a brief report that's not on here. Well, this one's on here on the uh, production issue. So if you want to get Jason, Jason to be next. So this is on the recall is what we wanted to do now while oh. we have this. But the other issue, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just jump to the uh, production or moratorium and continuing that. I wanted the commission to know that staff recommendation to you, to the governor, to the legislature on the continuing moratorium production licenses for marijuana in our system uh, that we want, uh, that we are making or will be making the recommendation to you and the legislature and the governor to continue that moratorium on production uh, for two more years. You know, you just need to look to the drought conditions in Southern Oregon and the intense water issues that everyone is dealing with across the agricultural landscape down there to recognize that um, now is not the time to be expanding that. And then the illegal cannabis, of course, issues are exacerbating that. We have plenty of supply in Oregon. Quite frankly, the illegal supply is uh, depressing the markets and the wholesale price even within our system today. Uh, so we think that's a responsible step to take uh, for the legislature, uh, for us and staff will be making that recommendation to you. We will not make a definitive recommendation on retail licensure. There's an issue about how many we have, what the competition is, but we will analyze that for you in the legislature so they can decide, you know, do you want a more uh, capitalistic open environment where, you know, they go, we just keep letting them in and people fail out in a you know, very open environment or whether you provide some protections by limiting some of that license on a temporary basis. That wasn't this has never been the nature of our system. Our system started as a very open system, but we did put those controls on um, production. We have supply. Uh, we know uh, we're not going to get uh, interstate commerce tomorrow. <laughs> um, so we got some time there, so we will be making that recommendation clear on the production. So Steve, yes. just to clarify, this is a, a recommendation for production moratorium, not to retail in. Right. Okay. We will analyze that. I mean, that's really about an issue of the philosophy of the market you want to have and the, how you want to deal with the distress they have out there because we have a lot of retail licensees mm -hmm. in this environment. You know, there's probably no right answer to that. There's a lot of answers to that. Um, you know, we'll provide some analysis to help people define their philosophies on what policymakers want to do to, you know, to repeat that market for the next couple of years. Sure,
commission? Uh, based on that statement, I think it's important for us to realize there's going to be significant pushback because of that. We still get phone calls. I still get phone calls from individuals in the business complaining about the number of either retail licenses or production. And I have to remind them that originally we wanted limitations on both production and licensees. The pushback was enormous, not only from those in the industry, but from organizations like the League of Cities who looked at the revenue stream that they possibly could gain, allowing retail operations to be on every corner in my community without any restrictions whatsoever. So here we are, five, eight years later, the market is crashing. A lot of had to do with the legal operation, but for the sheer volume. And I, I remind people, when we grant a licensee a liquor store, they have, a, they have an organization that's going to help support their family, send their kids to college, build in the community. I get phone calls from licensees complaining about the people across the street. So you're telling me you have another licensee, marijuana licensee, across the street from your business. Well, yes, I do. And they're not calling by the rules. So if we're going to have, and I agree with the restrictions, but understand there's going to be pushback and we need to be able to say, hold on, we're trying to protect the industry. We were trying to protect the industry before eight years ago because we have the experience as an organization helping companies grow. Wineries, distilleries, hard cider. So the pushback is going to come, we need to be prepared for that and say, we're trying to protect the industry, not simply your little business. And the, the suggestion just, Two years of moratorium that we're not we're not suggesting to shut it down shut the faucet off altogether right yeah it's really a continuation of the policy that they've had in place which actually we imposed it it wasn't a direct legislative moratorium they gave us sort of direction to get that done and we did uh we think that makes sense for the commission and for the legislation if there's a reason to change the legislature meets every year uh they can change it <laughs> Uh, in you know one year's time, but we think two years would provide additional stability for the market uh, for us and what we do with licensing and how we move forward. I can tell you our licensees and our retail licensees are, of course, very interested in uh, having limits, um, but we also know they're embedded in the system. They found their place, um, so <clears throat> we'll work with them and you and helping to get a public policy answer to that side of the equation as well. But on the production side, it's like with the problems that we're having in the state, with the supply we have, with the depressed wholesale prices across the market, and we've got to keep the flow profitable inside that Oregon market that we have overall. And I think uh, that's the right thing to do. And then with the water issues that are happening in Southern Oregon and across the state, uh, makes some sense. You know, we've seen what large scale cannabis looks like. This wasn't ours, it was illegal, large, you know, you know, acres of hoop houses uh, that are draining the water supply. You know, in southern Oregon, they cut it off. Uh, so that's come a little debate there. One we've been through before the legislature declines to put retail into the more foreign. Two and a half years ago. So that's that report, Mr. Chairman. We do want to talk about the recall underway and just give you a report on that. It is not on the agenda because it broke after we printed it. Why don't we do it now? Jason Hansen, please. Um, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Jason Hansen, uh, Director of Compliance. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah. we're fine. And, and Commissioners? He said director of compliance. He's been elevated. He is in the, the news. I think this is the I believe the first time you've testified in that capacity here, Jason. So thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I would have been happy to be there today. Um, but you know, given this recall, uh, the status of it and the recency of it, um, I, I have found that and my role in it uh, a much more effective 
in this virtual state by being able to respond to the staff and ensuring that we're meeting our responsibilities in it. So I am choosing to be here virtually today. Um, I want to keep this pretty high level, uh, given the activeness of the investigation on this recall. Um, so just a brief rundown of the timeline of events that has occurred. Uh, so this recall is for a, uh, hemp, a, a labeled hemp CBD tincture um, uh, by Cura CS. And the recall notice um, was prompted because we received a consumer complaint on September 9th. In the consumer complaint, they stated that they had purchased the same item previously, roughly within a month prior, um, had had good experience with the item, so decided to buy a few more uh, tinctures. And upon trying the second bottle that they purchased, um, they uh, they started experiencing what they believed to be symptoms consistent with use of THC. And so this tincture, as labeled, is uh, not a marijuana THC item. It's labeled as a hemp item, different um, universal symbol, and the uh, quantity for the ingredients. Um, as stated on the label, shows that there is a less than uh, LOQ, which is limit of quantification of THC, which basically tells us that the there is insignificant amount of THC in the product that the lab can identify when it was processed or tested. Um, so what, you know, in a consumer, when they take this product, they're not expecting to experience um, any uh, symptoms of THC use. Um, so uh, we received that complaint. Um, our response to that complaint was uh, the, the very same day we reached out to the complainant, we reached out to Cura, we assigned this to one of our inspectors, um, and, and the following Monday activated our uh, process that we use for recalls. Um, the protocol includes forming an internal team to evaluate the information that we have at hand, uh, determine a process to move forward, and establish benchmarks along the way uh, through the investigatory, pro investigatory process. Uh, we were able to um, uh, travel to the consumer's location and, and retrieve the product that they've still had um, in, in their possession. Uh, they had purchased three bottles, uh, three of these tincture bottles. Um, one they claimed to have used, the other two they claimed not to. So we, they, they were able to turn those over to us. Um, we, we brought them back to our facilities and tested them using the machines actually that we have available to us now that uh, Senior Director um, Rich Evans mentioned earlier in our hemp operations in Southern Oregon, these machines have been extremely valuable to us and helpful to us. Um, so it's something new to uh, our existence. Uh, on Tuesday of this week, we had the opportunity to test these products that, that we received from the consumer. All the products tested by the consumer, uh, that we, uh, from the products we got from the consumer came back with a THC amount that was in excess of what was on the label as well as in excess of what is allowed per a CBD tincture, a hemp CBD tincture. Um, had they been labeled as a marijuana THC tincture, um, the, the quantity of THC within the tinctures would have been within the allowable limits. However, because it's not labeled as such, um, this caused us concern. Um, in addition to that, to conduct a control study, we, uh, we obtained a couple of additional tinctures from local retailers we had in, in the area where we were doing the testing uh, that came from the same batch um, as we tracked uh, the same batch that we tracked these um, the, the consumers tinctures to and those two additional tinctures also came back um, with an excess amount of THC as labeled on the product. Um, so that all occurred on Tuesday of this week, uh, Tuesday morning and by the end of that afternoon at the beginning of that evening we issued a recall um, to the industry to the public um, that you have uh, you've probably seen by now. Um, the potential violations that we're investigating um, based on the information we have at hand uh, would be the excess THC per container, uh, because again, it's labeled as a hemp CBD tincture. Um, additionally, there are packaging and labeling violations um, because of the inaccuracy of the packaging um, uh, on the product. We notified the licensees. We've been in contact with the licensee uh, who manufactured the product. Um, we have, um, they have been, uh, they've been working with us. Uh, we sent them the update as we have it, as we had it when we tested the product so they could be aware of what we were finding. Um, we of course sent the press release and recall on Tuesday uh, with instructions to both licensees who may still have the product on hand 
uh, with what to do with that product, instructions to consumers, should they still have the product on what to do with that product, um, gave them guidance on who to notify should they have any health related concerns, as well as um, guidance and information on who they may contact should they have any information to share with us. Um, that all went out in that, in that recall notice. Uh, we've notified uh, the following day, we notified our agency partners. That was yesterday, um, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, Oregon Health Authority, um, and we are actively working with them as well um, to receive information that they may receive if, they, if uh, say, the poison control hotline is being uh, is, is called. Uh, so we're working in conjunction with them. The investigation is ongoing uh, to determine the cause and the parties involved. Um, at this time, we have quarantined and we have issued within the recall. Now, this was a mandatory recall. I do want to state that um, that we issued. It was not a voluntary one based on the findings that we found. Um, we, we at this time believe uh, roughly a couple of hundred of uh, packages are still uh, were in circulation at the time of the recall um, in our retail establishments. Uh, those have been directed to be quarantined and held, um, not allowed to be sold. Um, based on our records and our tracking so far, we did as was released in our notice, uh, we do anticipate roughly 500 um, tinctures have been sold already prior to the recall. Um, since the recall was initiated, that again was two days ago, we have received a couple of uh, additional calls, um, concerns from uh, consumers uh, and retail um, licensees who have also received um, a complaint and we are actively following up on those as well. So at that point, that's what I have to share. Um, I'm happy to field any questions you may have. Commissioners? Uh, the, so the, we tested the product that came from the complaint and then we tested a separate product from the same retail store. And um, um, same back. Okay. Yeah, uh, Commissioner, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Jason, sorry. That's all right. Um, so Commissioner Miletus, um, uh, Chair, so yes, we tested the product that came from the consumer, um, but of course we didn't, you know, because that has been potentially, uh, you know, it's been handled, it's been used, at least one of those bottles, we couldn't rely only on our outcome of those tests. So we, um, we went ahead to two separate retailers, both different than from where the, the consumer's products came from, okay? Um, although traced back to the same package. Uh, because of our cannabis tracking system, we are able to track um, the, the history of where this product came from. And so uh, we, we went and, and picked up a couple of different tinctures from two separate retailers, different from where the consumer purchased it from for control studies, all of which came back with uh, similar findings, um, consistent, you know, high THC, um they you know above what is allowed for that type of item yeah um and these are these are products that are uh cannabis derived or that are hemp derived well the claim on the label is that they are hemp derived cbd and you know the process you know of course our licensees all have their own business models and how they um you know prepare and manufacture their their products um you know a hemp cbd uh oil uh, can be um, combined with uh, THC oil uh, if, if, you know, dependent upon what the end result product you're trying to make. Um, um, but, but what we understand so far is that this hemp CBD oil was, was provided uh, by a hemp handler who, um, you know, sold it uh, to uh, this licensee who's, who then processed it into these tinctures um, and that were labeled to be a, a CBD only, hemp CBD only tincture, these specific packages. And was it sold at, at a, I'm trying to, it sold at a whole LCC uh, cannabis retailer? That it was hemp. Okay. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, Commissioner, uh, that is correct. Um, in fact, any, any item at this point that comes into a OLCC licensed uh, facility may only be sold by an OLCC licensed retailer. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and but the company's been responsive in their uh, efforts to to work work with the agency and resolve the issue. Yeah, Commissioner Melitis, that is correct. At this time, they have been available to us as needed. Um, have reached out for information that we can share with them. As I mentioned, it's, it is an ongoing investigation, so you know there. Are, you know, we are we haven't been able to determine the cause at this point or the, the entirety of the 
uh, the individuals involved, but yes, they have been available to us as we've needed. Okay. All right. Well, keep track of it. Good, good work. Steve, you have anything? Well, Mr. Chairman, I mean, it looked like you wanted to talk. So. I do a little bit here just to point out, you know, one, this is the first time we've rolled out this new recall process. I'm really proud of the team. I think, you know, we'll have to look at how it works in action here. Um, but you can see it, it's evolving. We're moving faster. Those lab, lab testing capabilities have given us the ability to do things like get a test from them <clears throat> that we can rely on ourselves and not have to go to licensees and lab licenses to get tests. Uh, we are moving much quicker and professionalizing this recall effort. I just point out that the danger we have in this mistake of THC getting into a hemp product is exactly what we're looking at in House Bill 3000 in the general market with people getting THC and living. In this case, I don't fully understand and haven't had a full report on it, but apparently a woman was driving and got, you know, realized she was getting stoned or starting to get an exhibit that day. You want to drive and stop. Uh, so there's a danger here to these products being out there and I just pushed it over to. You couldn't do this for those hemp products in the general market, what we're doing here, uh, because they don't have track and trace on them in the same way, and they don't have the same level of staffing accountability around them. So, you know, protecting the public with these products is something that you can get when you track, trace, and centralize some of the responsibilities for those actions to happen. Okay. Jason, thank you, and congratulations again. Well deserved. Well, well come on up, Chris. Come on up. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Mayton. I'm the Director of the Distilled Spirits Program for the OLCC. And I am here today to give you another brief update on the warehouse and headquarter relocation project. They're going to start getting more and more complicated as we go. A few more months away. Yes, Enjoy sir. your brief. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Um, currently, just so you know, uh, Gas Real Estate Services and our broker, which is Cushman Wakefield, are in um, contract negotiations with four properties, and they are putting together a matrix of all the negotiated process. Uh, uh, properties for us to review. Uh, the delivery date on that matrix is still yet to be determined, um, but we are on schedule uh, for February being our, our final selection date. But between now and February, what will happen is after that matrix is received by, by the OLCC, uh, our staff will schedule an executive session with you uh, for the final selection process. Um, and then following that final selection process, the staff here will work with Dash Real Estate and Cushman Wakefield to develop the purchase sales agreement for that selected property. Um, and as I said before, we are on track for a February 2022 selection date. That was in our timeline. That's what we're hopeful for. So um, if I were to estimate, we should start to see some uh, negotiation properties coming in the next uh, two months. Uh, so it, it should be coming up pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and then lastly, the interviews for our third party construction project management company. Uh, those will occur on uh, this next Monday, September 27th. So um, things have been moving rather slowly, as as we say, as the, as Chairman just pointed out, but things are starting to heat up, and things will start to move very quickly once that property selection is, is placed, and then it's architect, and, and then it's design, and then it's construction, and then on top of that, we're working with IT constantly to set the parameters around the um, enterprise upgrade uh, that the agency is going to need to do location as well. So uh, with all that being said, the warehouse is still um, max capacity, especially now we're, we're going into OND or the fourth quarter uh, for sales. So Nikki and her team are, are really doing a great job keeping production going. Um, we have not missed any days of, of shipping um, since the uh, June LOA um, dismissal or the leave of absence um, from the executive order. Our staffing capacity is getting better. Um, we're less, most most days under and single digit absenteeism. So our, our lines are, are more functional. Uh, retail stores are doing fantastic. I think uh, in August we were up three and a half percent. So Brian's got his team uh, directed well. Uh, if you look at year to date, 
Um, sales are up about five and a half percent or $27 million over 2020, which was a, a COVID year, which um, it, as you've heard before, some pantry hoarding uh, that happened last year, and we're, we're still outpacing that. And we have eight expansion stores that are still in various um, stages of construction that you approved earlier um, in the summer. Um, we expect our first store opening in December and, and then uh, us probably four more in January with the last couple ending, ending in March. So uh, that is the Distilled Spirits Program update, and I'll answer any questions that you may have. Anybody have any questions? I, I just have one. My good friend uh, Xander in North Carolina left. Tell us about that. Tell us that we don't have the same. <laughs> well, I can say we won't be that guy. <laughs> North, North Carolina had a lot of. They had a lot of. That's very strange for him to do that. A lot of empty shelves in the liquor stores in North Carolina um, for various of reasons. But um, from all the, all the markers that I see, um, it was just a uh, a mess at the of staffing uh, and their ability to you know, manufacture themselves through that. And as I said earlier, Nikki and her team have done a great job keeping the doors open. If you go back to the first days of the pandemic, uh, we did have to shut off some services uh, for repack, our single bottle picks, but that makes up about 5% of our total volume. I know that that gets some of our licensees in the, the most <laughs> uproars, but I mean, from a shipping capacity, she kept the doors open every day. We didn't miss a single bottle, any shelves, that were left empty were left empty because the manufacturer couldn't supply the product because of shortages, um, you know, globally in glassware or bottles. Um, but uh, Nikki and her team have done a fantastic job, and Brian and his team have kept all the stores open. I, I think we lost maybe three stores due to COVID, um, you know, for a couple days, up to ten days. And then even if you remember back in last year, the wildfires, uh, we did lose a couple stores in the wildfires, but uh, you know those are still progressing, and we're working with the communities to to get them back open where we can. And one of them, I think Detroit's already, it, it's already been reopened. So a lot of good work by the team. We've got a great staff uh, behind me that, that keeps uh, the, the revenue flowing for the state. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Chris, you mentioned that we were up in sales. Is that, did we increase pricing at all? So we don't really increase pricing. Uh, that's the manufacturers. And and they do that um, twice a year. They they go to their what they call their regular price. And then two times a year, they're able to drop their pricing. Uh, pricing typically does rise on our products. If you look at it organically, um, about 25 to 3% annually is what I would guess the, the average inflation rate is. But, you know, you can look at some products, and I'll just pull one that is off the top of my, my, my mind, Jack Daniels. When I was looking at pricing and we were doing the floor pricing survey, Jack Daniels had the same price as it did in 1997 as it did last year. So some wow. prices just stays the same. It's really up to the manufacturer because our formula is standard and we just apply it to the FOB price that comes in that we buy the product at. So it's up to the manufacturer to determine what the retail price they want to go to market with. So that uptick in sales then is really actually sales. It's just sales, just sales. Uh, That's great. A lot of it driven by innovative product because there's a lot of new products coming into the market the last couple of years. Uh, That's great. If I may, uh, Chair, can I ask Mr. Fleming, and I hate to put Brian, I hate to put you on the spot, but can I ask him for? You can ask him for anything you want. Oh, well, in that case, Mr. Fleming. Um, would you mind just giving a briefing of, you know, how our expansion stores are doing? Um, are any of them open right now? Um, if you could just give just a quick, quick briefing on each of those locations and where they're at. I'd like to know. That's a good question. Morning, Chairman, Commissioners, for the record. Uh, Brian Fleming, Director of Retail Services. Um, interesting. I anticipate it may be a question or two. Uh -huh. So uh, in terms of uh, retail and opening, uh, that's the, generally what you want to know, right? Mm -hmm. So we have approved, I printed this off so small, so I'm going to squint. It's just my little tracker. Um, Gresham uh, location, full speed ahead. Uh, this was Keith Johns. Oregon City, if you remember the bank, uh, the bank said, mm, we don't want any liquor. Uh, went to another place, well, that fell through. So we're going to be looking for a little bit here uh, to secure a location. Uh, Portland Southwest Waterfront, full speed ahead. However, uh, waiting on the uh, tenant who's next door to vacate and move out because their lease expires and then it'll go pretty swiftly. 
uh, Portland Lentz neighborhood. Um, I'm going to read. No, uh, so the lease is all done. Everything's in place. Uh, however, construction uh, and building out the business is going to take some time uh, for this location. Uh, Southeast Powell, the lease is signed. We're eight to 12 weeks out on permit delays. I think everybody knows that that's happening. Portland Gleason, uh, letter of intent uh, with the landlord formal. Um, the contract was executed. This was an interesting uh, location, uh, but the agent is committed to the community. Um, Kiana, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Floyd, you were involved with this. Uh, I think we can do good here uh, at some point. And, you know, a lot of the complaints around the existing marijuana business. Yeah. I think we can do more with our individual there, as well as a heightened awareness in the neighborhood. Yeah, so. but, you know, and for the record, I was concerned also um, about this location after hearing, you know, Correct. Um, you know, some of the issues from the neighborhood. Um, I hope, I just want to say this, I hope that that agent, uh, Mr. Rothman Fletch, I believe, mm -hmm. I hope he makes good, he's got some great recommendations of things that he's going to implement and I really hope that he uh, makes good on those um, and I'd like to see in six months time after he opens those doors what it, in fact he's doing to make good on, on, on some of those promises that he made to that neighborhood. We, we will hold them to and uh, Mr. Chairman for the record when appointed in May uh, Mr. Roth and Fletch had committed to this commission that you know should he be appointed for a second store he was going to be on site because he actually I remember why, that. Uh, why he put in his resignation for the company he was with is beyond me because you know you never know what happens but he did effectively re resign he's a skilled attorney a uh, smaller firm uh, I think he he lives in this neighborhood a couple miles away I can't remember the name but he's in the inner city Portland neighborhoods he does understand uh, but he resigned from this position. And so, you know, he had some frustration. Uh, just, I wish I had known. Well, some of that was the resignation of his own accord. We did not tell him to do that, nor did the chairman. Uh, the chairman expressed that he wanted to see him working on site, which he does every day. And it's yeah, existing. Will you please tell him we appreciate that? Yep, we certainly will. I, I probably call him first of the week to see where next week, mm -hmm. see where we're at in the process. So. That's not going to get him a third store, but we appreciate it. <laughs> uh, based on his success at his second, you may consider it. You never know. Um, uh, last thing, Portland Fremont. This is an interesting one. Um, this is, you know, a lot of what uh, Portland's become today. Uh, big condos or apartments over big retail, uh, pet grooming, nail salons, liquor stores, uh, which is very much like Mr. Roth and Fletch. We did approve the location, the HOA above. Uh, we extended the uh, uh, hosting because they said they weren't properly informed. Uh, part of that is a uh, key card access to inform neighbors. Uh, the landlord and appointed agent uh, have been, uh, I think the HOA has legal counsel that they're trying to push to not lease to this individual. Um, in this particular case, uh, they believe they have no legal grounds to do so. However, the agent is stepping back for a second to say, let's see if there's something else too, because I don't know that I want to live with that every day. Um, I think you've seen the liquor stores we've put together. We have not, in my opinion, created problems in neighborhoods. I think we've created some vibrancy in some cases. They're always well lit. They're new. Uh, and we don't attract the things that uh, maybe uh, people of yester yesteryear think of our liquor stores. We run a darn good operation uh, through these independent contractors. So more to come on Fremont. I know this is your neighborhood. Uh, I think we're going to, you know, at some point achieve what we want. It'll be a pretty small boutique location, uh, but we just need to secure a lease and make sure the agents set up for success with the lease and or landlord and community members. Last one, uh, Tigard. So Tigard, if you recall the original location, about 5,500 square feet. It was a fantastic proposal. Uh, two weeks after commission, it was leased out from underneath them. 
uh, to a golf shop. Um, I'm betting on a liquor store long term, but the uh, the uh, uh, actually the owner of the property contacted me personally. Uh, questions after the fact, and he says, you know, I just had this guy that you know we're really excited to get his business going. The good news is this: it's going to be a little smaller, 2,800 square feet, I believe. Uh, this is uh, Clifford King. Uh, JPO LLC. It's going to be smaller, but it's in the exact same complex, uh, and they're going to have a smaller version of what they originally intended. Uh, I think they're close to signing the lease in Tigard. Uh, it was unfortunate because you know four or five thousand square foot liquor stores that have the full a company of beer, wine, spirits, glassware, cigars, whatever that whole thing looks like, um, you know, has certainly helped our business. And customers just you know, dig on the new model that we have. So, How long is the lease, roughly? Uh, this it'll be a five-year lease to begin with. Um, so yeah, they're locked in. Okay. Yeah, and and you know, this isn't doesn't necessarily mean forever. We'll see as we get open. I know there's still they were looking at purchasing, but it was a little outside boundary. So we're working. You know, the district manager is working. One on one, uh, the DM has also spoke with the landlord, had a lot of questions. The questions for me is from this guy was, well, what what is a liquor store and how does it work? And I, I said, well, we typically have very very long term relationships, and um, you know, when we open liquor stores until they outgrow space, and you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, we'll still have a good location in Tigard. I think we'll have a you know, the model is still the same, one-stop shop convenience. And I think the individual uh, is poised and ready to put this together with a couple of team members that are kind of industry retail type veterans and the alcohol beverage. Right, industry. but it's a much more dummy down operation and experience that he was really looking forward to having. Um, this was supposed to be an experience, you know, and, and something um, one to really model, but um, unfortunate because the whole cigar room, I think, was one of the experiences. This individual is very well connected in the professional sports industry, right? Uh, exactly. Having you know, um, uh, celebrity type events, or I think we'll have some of that, but maybe not at the same level. Uh, however, you know, a lot of our customers they just walk in and then they see what's going on, and hopefully, they'll have those kind of experiences in the store put together as well. I believe they will because it'll help their business. So out of the, let's see, eight, correct, mm -hmm. expansion stores, we've got uh, the Highland, the Gresham location is the only one up and running as of right now. No, not running. So I'll give you, a, pardon me uh, for interrupting, that one's uh, likely as early as December. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the earliest is December. Chris had mentioned uh, some in January. It's possible. Okay. Um, but you know, a lot of this is permitting construction and even a thing, uh, like Logier shelving that you put the bottles on, uh, they're at, they were at 12 and 16 weeks to order the shelving cost has got up significantly as well. So, and it's not always just the shelf, it's the piece that connects it or the stanchion. So there's a host of delays in, the in, the, uh, the fixtures, uh, inside the store. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you. But I think December we'll see our first online. Uh, I think, you know, um, Keith, who I think you remember, he had the convenience store, uh, been around retail a long time. I, I, he's pretty excited to get rolling. So I think we'll open as soon as we can get uh, the fixtures in place. Uh, but they are painting or building out the things they can uh, in a couple of these locations. And where are we with expansions? What's the next step? Yeah, sure. that's a that's a great question. Uh, it moves at the pace of which I think we want to try and get some of these. Steve had mentioned during expansion in May that sometime after the first of the year we would look to the next phase of expansion. Uh, and I think uh, you know with all the delays we're having today, um, we you know probably revisit this late this fall and then figure out is it January, February, March, and then where are we heading. And that'll be, you know, Steve, Chris, uh, you know, discussion of what's next, how many. And, you know, we've learned some things through this phase of expansion. Um, and that is, is 
we've done the big strip malls. We've done, you know, the footprints across Oregon. Now we're moving inside of communities with narrow pieces of retail and not everybody likes having a liquor store. Uh, so I think we've learned some things for the future that'll help us uh, with some of the things we experienced during this phase. I kind of anticipated, you know, a little bit of this, but it's all commercial real estate that was available and the operators found these locations. So. Chairman, uh, uh, Commissioner Curran, uh, we had identified uh, approximately 33 expansion store locations to grow into over the course of five years. Uh, we, we did the first phase, which is this phase 6.1. Uh, we have eight. So 6.2 should be eight to 10 more stores in 2022 with final opening by summer of 2023. So um, we're trying to get to that 300 benchmark that uh, Director Marks has so promised. Thank you. And, and when you think of, you know, big liquor stores, uh, Portland's a lot of that, maybe Eugene or Salem. We have some rural areas that might be able to bolt something onto their business, help them, help us with, you know, distribution availability. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we get to some of those small models that, you know, consumers desire and don't have to drive 10 miles from Woodburn to St. Paul or whatever area we're looking at. In, in you need to buy some liquor before you go fly fishing. <laughs> uh, fly fishing and liquor. No, actually, I don't drink when I fish. <laughs> After the fishing is done. <laughs> Thank you both. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is that all? Yep. Uh, Steve, are you done, or do you want to deal some more with the licensing moratorium? Nope, I think uh, I we got it. Yeah. Okay, my favorite person. I don't know about anybody else. Welcome, Nikki. Hey, um, good morning, Chair, Bob, and Commissioner. For the record, I'm Nikki Leslie, Distribution and Purchasing Director. Before I get into this, I want to address some of your concern about our staff. That you brought up. My team and I had constantly, we are regularly in contact with our supplier. We basically try to be limbo and adjust when we need to. When we have certain items that's an issue, if we have to, we take we do take alternate action by bringing in the plastic if we need to in place of the glass when there was a glass shortage. We have bring in a, another size, for example, mine is Palova. 750, they're having some issue with international shipping. We're going to be out of stock of that until October, early November. So what we did was increase our leader inventory mm -hmm. to offset the impact. And we have also on product, we have limited like 800 cases, crown roll. We will try to put a case limit on how much each store can order so that we're not seeing 100 cases in one store. We try to make sure it's spread out across the state. So we do take action to try to do alleviate some of that stuff. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, um, I'm here today to present before the commission the, pro the product listing activity for the month of June, July, and August. Under tab one, you'll find detailed list of product activity during this period. Staff recommend commissioners confirm the seven, six items on the list. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Michael, you want to make the motion? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like. I have a question, though, uh, Chair. This, uh, uh, Nikki for and Chris for this uh, listing. I, I recognize that we are we are approving a, a, a large number of cans, um, four four cans, and um, can you uh, sort of discuss how we how we confirmed and uh, and reviewed. Items that are that are placed in cans um, in, in in our center, and then also uh, talk about how the cans affect our 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 liquor agents. Okay, all the can cocktail products, other than unless it's an organ distiller, um, are required to go to the listing commission committee. Those are all being approved by the committee. That's including the agent staff that make those decisions and it's based on voting um that um we have i think last uh, listing we have about 15 in on the committee but the voting would be just the agent and the district manager and uh, by the retail service team so the majority vote and then the majority if um if, if the answer is yes then we bring it in 
If not, we say no. That's the process for the can. And are the cans when when they're voted upon when they're reviewed, are the is the product to us cold or hot? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the product came in and uh, basically regular like shipment in the case. We don't, you know, we send the product. So right now we're doing it virtually. So the product I'll be shipping out to the committee across the state. So the um, the committee might put them in a freezer. I mean, in a refrigerator before the meeting. Some don't. That's not their choice. So. So it comes it comes to it comes direct directly to our warehouses. Do do we have uh, facilities that can keep the product cold or hot? No, we don't. We don't have a facility to keep the product cold or hot. That's it's basically room temperature, I would say, or the warehouse temperature, which is about six. Okay, so so when I'm when I'm at the redemption center and I see these cans come in. And they all uh, have a uh, ten cents um, return on them. Uh, does does that also uh, affect us at the uh, in the commission or in the warehouse since we are required by state to to get the ten ten cent uh, deposit back? The can of distilled spirit top can cocktail we uh, can do not have or should not have ten cents deposit on it. Right. Um, if they do, if we catch it, if we're aware of it, we will contact the supplier to basically to discontinue this. And we also reach out to the uh, retail store, the liquor agent, to let them know not to be um, charging 10 cents for the product. Right, because I, I see a lot of them just piling up in our redemption centers. Okay, and my last question, uh, Chair, is, is this, Nikki, is this going to be a, a trend because I'm, I'm noticing more cans uh, in, in in retail centers that don't have um, uh, approval from or through the OLCC. Um, but if if they if these items are approved, they automatically are are able to get on on our uh, shelves. Is that correct? Correct. They are made available for the liquor agent to order. It is. It is the liquor agent's choice if they choose to bring the product into their liquor store or not. Uh, because I, I see this as a potential um, uh, issue in regards to um, uh, law enforcement not recognizing um, if it's just a soda or if it if it is a distilled spirit, and potentially it could become. Uh, a, a public health issue if if we don't recognize it and make sure that there is a, a differentiation in regards to the way these uh, distilled spirits are, are are marketed and sold. And in in the past, we didn't we didn't approve or accept a lot of canned items. And I just want to put it on the record that <clears throat> as we become more modernized in regards to the pricings of, I know these companies look at the difference between uh, manufacturing uh, their product in a bottle or now they have honed it such that the, the the taste is similar in a can that that we keep an eye on these things and make sure that uh this will not become a, a huge issue right. so um i just want to make make sure I, I i um you recognize that uh, nikki and and, and I, I know that the commission or we'll continue to look at the items, and I'm, I'm seeing on our list this uh, the last three uh, three months. There's some high level um, companies that are putting their items in cans and say and saving a lot of money due to to the glass items. So um, thank you so much for listening to me, and the commissioners. Thank you so much for uh, recognizing this trend. Chair, Chair May, Commissioner Harper, this is uh, again Chris Maiden, the Still Spirits Program Director. Uh, just uh, one more clarification. In our liquor stores, uh, they are able to sell both distilled spirits, ready to drink canned cocktails, and they also have the choice of purchasing <coughs> from private distributors the wine based, like, uh, for instance, White Claw or Truly. So in a store, you will see both. I will tell you that in the distilled spirits category of RTD canned cocktails, it's the fastest growing segment, and it has been for the last three years. We get 15 to 25 different products every listing meeting, 
uh, coming into the state trying to get um, put on the shelves. But as Vicki mentioned, as Brian has before, we make recommendations to all of the liquor stores about what the best shelf selection set is. But at the end of the day, they're independent contractors who buy what they want to buy for their liquor stores. Um, so canned cocktails is a growing issue in the state because of its innovation and growth rate. We are getting a, a plethora of products, you know, creating a lot of proliferation for stores to figure out how much shelf space they need to set. And that's creating uh, more issues in, it, in itself because there's a different margin of pay based on a distilled spirits can cocktail versus a, a wine-based cocktail that they buy from a private distributor. So, and, um, right, and also a uh, canned cocktail right now, a uh, cocktail category overall, overall in the state is um, for Oregon. It's very small for us still for the still spare canned cocktail. Even with the small as it is compared to last year, we grew up over two point. I think the last time I checked, two point two million just compared to last year. So it is a very growing category. Still small, but it is growing. And Mr. Chairman, for the record, Steve Marks, Executive Director. Michael, just to clarify, if there are malt-based cocktail cans, they do are redeemable. Like a beer, like a beer can has a redemption. So those malt-based ones are redeemable uh, today. They are not in our system. And I'll just point out to the commission that we've had a discussion about what to do with low ABV distilled spirits cocktails in a can. Uh, one legislator, Marty Walby, wanted to follow up on the discussions during session. We will have a work group looking. They had a lot to the best possible. Well, and whether we want to move some of those products into the general market, marketplace with distilled spirits at low ABV, right? So they would fit there. So the real issue is, you know, we're not building warehouse capacity to deal with a large Distilled spirits, cocktails, and candy. Uh, well, if we're going to have that in Oregon, it's going to take place in the general market. How you set the tax rate compared to our markup is a big issue there for the state on the revenue side of what they expect. Uh, and then, you know, last time we had this discussion two years ago, you know, beer and wine are not exceedingly, although some of the beer companies and some of the wine companies are getting into this, but are not exceedingly excited about having the competition of this new product there. But it is happening in open states, it's happening across the country, and so there's a, a policy decision there. And we're gonna have a discussion with our partners across the spectrum of alcohol to see if uh, uh, Oregon uh, wants to make a change. That's a, that's a much more complex issue than we're talking about here, because it brings up a whole lot of other issues that, that uh, no need to go into now, yeah. but yeah. I think we're all talking about it. And the redemption issue is brought in and out as well about maybe a discussion about applying it even the wine bottles uh, generally. So there's uh, evolving discussions on both the things that uh, Michael was raising. I need a motion. Right. Oh, uh, hey, one more question before we uh, chair. Of course. Um, if if it's okay, um, of course. Director Marks, thank thank you so much for the for the for the clarification. If it's possible, um, I'd like to see if we, if see the, again, the issue is tax because cans are, four packs are taxed per can. But if it's possible, can you, by, um, by what you just uh, informed me, can you get me uh, some type of, uh, or, or direct me to someone to speak with or speak to in regards to, you know, um, the issue in regards to redemption and also the difference between the, um, the the cocktails and also the the items that we're uh, proposing to approve today just just so i can have that for my um for my education in regards to items that are in cans um that are distilled spirits versus the um the wine uh cans appreciate it all right thank you okay i need a motion chair uh, since, Commissioner, go ahead. Commissioner Harper, it looks like he's ready to go. Yeah, you got to give him one, one, one in a session. Go ahead, Commissioner Harper. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll get it out right now. I move to confirm the 76 items for June, July, and August. Please take the roll. Commissioner Curran. 
Yes. Commissioner Floyd. Yes. Commissioner Harper. Yes. Commissioner Miletus. Yes. Commissioner Raval. Yes. Chair Rosenbaum. Yes. Um, before you guys go, Nikki, you're back in the warehouse. You do a fantastic job. I just want to tell you we appreciate you. It, 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 we we really do know the job you're doing back there. You're fantastic, and I just I want to thank you. For that. And Chris, you're up here. We know who you are, but you're doing a fantastic job too. Thank you. Thank you both. It's it's very much appreciated, and it's nice to be able to say that you both of you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do know what's going around here. Uh, you don't know about what <laughs> I'd be surprised. All right. Um, I think at this point we go into an executive session. Or like the Yeah. No, we're already Okay, we already we already did that. So we're I, unless somebody corrects me, we're going into executive session, right? Okay. Uh, we're just going into executive session. <laughs> Laura, will you do me a favor? I can't figure it out. This chair is down. Like, <laughs> 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 well, you you it's got to be on this side. I can you. I tried it, but you know what? You can't do it when you're sitting there. No, you can't. And there are four things, and of course, they're all. So what is that exactly? I'm just going to talk shit. Everybody put out a scroll so they can see it again. So reach in today. Muted. Again? Oh. Of course we left them. Well, that's what you missed by that. <laughs> it's a crybaby. Did they close the back? Yeah, we can help them come back. She has to did you just close it? Just leave the meeting, yeah. Okay, no more talking. Oh, yeah, you got to go. session I I uh, like to uh, indicate that I was wrong when I asked to go into executive session uh, we just had a recess and uh, uh, I made a mistake I say. okay Michael we're on with you Michael you're we can't hear you why can't we hear you? Michael, can you hear us? Okay. Um, 
Can you go to your settings, the little gear up at the top right hand corner and maybe try switching your microphone, see if that works. No. Nope. Try unplugging your headphones that you were using maybe. Sometimes that messes mine up. Does that work? Yes. Yay. Okay, great. <laughs> Push enough buttons, eventually something happens here. Uh, good morning, Chair Rosenbaum, members of the commission. For the record, I'm Michael Schein with the Administrative Hearings Division. And we would like to present for your ratification three alcohol stipulated settlements. And before you consider those, I do want to put on the record with regard to the a third stipulated settlement for Copper Cane, uh, that there have been some agreed minor date changes uh, since the agreement was signed, specifically paragraph two, the payment due date is moved from September 15 to October 15, 2021. And so the payment would not be due until October 15, 2021. And paragraph five is changed to say that this will be submitted to the commission as it is being submitted right now at the September 2021 meeting. Aside from those changes, the agreements are as presented to you and we request your ratification. Are there any questions about the alcohol violation stipulation settlement agreement? If none, and there appears to be none, let's get a roll. Oh, I need a motion, please. Yes. Chair? Yes. I move to ratify the three stipulated settlement agreements as proposed by staff. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Curran? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Michael? Thank you. Um, we have uh, five stipulated marijuana settlements that we would present for your ratification. And once again, I want to put on the record that uh, in the Clay Wolf matter, uh, there are there has been a, a change or two that was agreed to since it was signed. Uh, there are some red line changes in paragraph three and four, which do read correctly that the date is changed to November 15, 2021. Uh, in paragraph 12, there are two places that are not quite accurate. First, it's being submitted to the commission September 2021 instead of August 2021. And the final date in that paragraph 12 should read November 15, 2021 and not the date that's stated in August. And those uh, have been agreed to um, by, by the licensee's attorneys uh, prior to submitting this to you. Thank you, Michael. Commissioners, any questions? Uh, uh, Chair Rosenbaum, Commissioner Harper here. Commissioner Harper. All right, Michael, is there any new written uh, documentation in regards to change of ownership? Um, um uh, uh, reviews a change of ownership uh policy uh no that there are i think uh, as you're probably noticing there are several violations that do involve um uh, either undisclosed or unapproved interests uh those charges are under rule uh, uh 845 025 1160 sub 4 uh, that rule has been consistently in place uh, since uh, for some time, I think unchanged probably since 2018, certainly 2019. Uh, we have case precedent uh, on that in the West decision uh, from the commission. So, so the rules haven't changed. It just so happens that um, uh, there are several cases that involve that issue that are before you. Thank you. Okay, I need a motion. Chair Rosenbaum. Commissioner Ravel. I move to ratify the following marijuana stipulated settlements. Settlements agreed as proposed by staff. 
Please take the roll. Commissioner Curran? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Evall? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Okay, before we uh, uh, go any further, I just want to make clear something that I, I've asked for on the licensing uh, uh, education or whatever you want to call it. I, for the last two commission meetings, I'm not concerned with people coming on the new, we're, we're covered. I'm not creating any additional burdens for anybody. I don't want that and I don't want any bureaucracy on this. All I'm saying is when, when we see a violation in front of us that we have to vote on and it's not so obvious of the people that we took their licenses away today, but those were egregious. It's when you have a situation where there's one category one violation, three category uh, three violations, and two category four violations, the license isn't going to be taken from them, but there is obviously a problem. And all I'm asking for for the next meeting, or maybe when the meeting is over, is to have a discussion with staff as to the specific situations where people come in front of us, we make a decision with them, their license is still intact, and I think the agency should spend an hour or two with these people to see what we can do to help them. That's it. I don't want anything else on it. It's not, it's not a big deal uh, to help people who are struggling. I've said enough on it. Steve, do you have any uh, other comments before? No, I think that helps clarify. You know, quite frankly, we've got education as a sanction. So something to think about about how we actually integrate it into the process for those that aren't egregious. Those that are slipping away if they don't listen or learn. Right. <laughs> right. Just put the on. A lot of those, I can tell you, a lot of those will be. Uh, I think a lot of the kinds of cases where education might be really helpful to keep them from falling over the edge is those folks that are in charge of metric and making metric mistakes regularly enough that it's getting them in trouble and we're about ready to push them over the edge and take their license. Those might be somewhere, you know, we do more work or commend them to additional training or changes there. That's one example of maybe how we incorporate some of that thinking into Just what we do. Just let's uh, do that, okay? Yep. Any other comments? My last comment is, do we have enough money in the budget to change that from Oregon Liquor Control Commission to Oregon Liquor Cannabis Commission? Chairman, it is done. That, and you know what I'm talking about. Oh, no, I don't. It's right oh, here in front of yeah, us. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and it's, everybody sees it. We've made the changes. We want to put cannabis rather than well, control we'll get, we'll on get this it. right in front. We will get to that one and we'll get to that sooner than we get to some of our other. And the one in the back. Meeting is there.